Welcome, everybody. My name is Nina Jane. I am one of the programming librarians at the Cary Library. So excited to bring you here for this wonderful program on All Roads Lead to Romance. Um, this amazing panel is going to be talking about what led them to romance. But before we get to that, I have a couple things to say. One is that we are recording and we are on um, live streaming on Facebook. So you can put questions here on Zoom on, um, in the Q&A. And you can use the chat for comments or tech issues, and we'll be paying attention to that. Facebook Live, you can also put questions in there uh, on Facebook Live, and I will um, use them during the session as well. So lots of ways to ask questions, um, because this is an important topic. Um, let me see. I would like to thank Harper Collins and Pam Jaffe for helping us bring this program together, but also um, Vanessa and Kate, um, who <laughs> actually uh, you know, like, we're like, yes, I want to do that. So I, you know, I appreciate everybody, everybody who helped us bring this together. I'd also like to thank the Cary Library Foundation, which funds all of our um, adult programs. We could not do it without them. So thank you to them. Um, you can buy signed books from any of these authors from Bank Square Books. I'll put the link in um, the chat at some point. And, um, you know, I think that signed books are gold. So uh, make sure you have some gold in your house. <laughs> um, but it, whatever you do, you could buy their books. They're great. They're amazing. Or go to the library and enjoy them because they're so good. You have to read them no matter any way you can get them. Um, so without further ado, I'm not going to do like an official sort of introduction, but I am going to say I'm really, really pleased to welcome to the Cary Library today author, authors James Bailey, Kate Bateman, Vanessa Riley, Eloisa James, and Misha Sharma. And we're talking about what their careers have been before becoming romance writers. Some of you have continued being in those um, fields and some of you have uh, moved away from them to write romance full time. So I'm just gonna ask really quick, what, <laughs> I grew up watching To Tell the Truth. I'm wondering um, in our um, attendees in the chat, right, could you write who you think is a lawyer and EDI coordinator amongst these authors? or has been? Hmm, who could that be? Anybody? No? Oh. <laughs> Good guesses. So in like to tell the truth, <laughs> please raise your hand if you are an EDI in, uh, coordinator and lawyer. <laughs> yeah, that's your unique story. <laughs> and you are currently um, still working as an EDI coordinator, right? So I, I wore the sweatshirt because I've been in the tech industry forever. So I thought like it would, <laughs> it just kind of, it fit the the careers that I've had. But I, I was a compliance attorney for a while. And then I shifted into compliance and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as of like, six months ago, I opened up my own consulting company. So now I just consult part-time and, and I write full-time. So <laughs> still working 60 hour weeks, but it's oh. doing more of the stuff I love. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so it, uh, who is our tech guru? Not Nisha, cause she's, uh, <laughs> we've already done her. Who do you guys think is our tech guru here? Worked in tech, high tech. Hmm. Interesting guesses. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, so again, amongst uh, who's our uh, uh, our panelists, who is our tech guru? Me? Yep. <laughs> it's Vanessa. <laughs> and you are not working in tech now, right? I still have my my software company. Yes. Oh, okay. Interesting. Hmm. We're going to be talking about all of that. Um, who is our journalist. And who is our journalist? <laughs> James, you guys were good on that one. Okay, so now that we only have two people left, we are going to do who is 
which one of um, either Kate or Eloisa is either a fine arts appraiser or a professor? All right, well, you guys don't get to raise your hands, but yes, Eloisa, wait, wait, Eloisa is a professor and Kate is our fine arts appraiser. So good job, everybody. <laughs> uh, you know your authors, that's for sure. Um, so <laughs> um, again, we're gonna, now that we know a little bit of your background, we're gonna start with um, this question, which is a really simple one that, um, is what led you to be a ro to write romance? And I'm gonna start with Vanessa since she um, <laughs> she was the first one that signed on for this program. <laughs> you caught me on a good uh, a good email day. That's you know I'm pretty <laughs> horrible with that. Um, I I um, I've always been a person who has liked to write as well as math, and at different points in my life, math won. And at other points, prose one. So um, I think that's the balance. You, you um, my mother really encouraged us for literature, um, really encouraged us to read. So we were always reading in the house, uh, but she was also a math, you know, very much into math and accounting and things like that. So you always have these tenuous draws and tr truthfully early on, um, the success, more successful, more, the more logical path that one would take would be mathematics and engineering um, and the hard sciences, because that's primarily where, you know, middle-class kids, they have the biggest shot. I mean, the, being a novelist is like a dream job, right? And it's, it's like lightning, you know, striking. So if you're going to choose which one, you, I went with the, you know, mom always said pay the bills. So you got to go with the ones going to pay the bills and that was engineering. <laughs> totally makes sense. Um, and is that what led you to romance though? Like the, the thinking, the, that way of... It, it actually was differential equations. Um, they, they got so hard that I needed something to just take my mind completely, completely away. And so then I would start sneaking books in that were just, you know, uh, Wood I, Woodweiss and, and uh, Beverly Jenkins and uh, Eloisa. And it just, you just, you just get, you gotta go someplace else, some other place to just be able to really act. And, and so romance has always been the relax, the way I relax. And uh, the promise of a happy ever after is so important when you're looking at your math grades. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Eloisa? Well, I would say one fascinating thing is that I actually started out in programming. And I think there's a lot to writing romance and programming. I mean. You know, I was programming quite a while ago. It was the first job I had out of college, basically. Um, I did it in England as well. And they have to end out right. I mean, that's what I loved about it. Like it's, it, you know, you do it and do it and do it. And if it doesn't end, you know, instantly. And if a book, if a romance, you know what the end is supposed to be, which is why I think, I think romance is so much more challenging in a way than writing literary fiction, which of course I've never done. So it's easy for me to say that, but, um, we know where we have to go and we have to get there with originality and precision in between. And so um, it sounds like our family background was kind of the same, Vanessa. My sister is actually now a, a, a big programmer. She tells um, big companies like Stolik Nye and so on. She does all their marketing assessment. And um, I look at her career sometimes, I look at mine. We both figured out how to work from home and make money, which if you grew up on a farm and my father was a poet was serious. <laughs> like you know, like your mother said, yeah, we knew what to, what, what to put first, but it was a great way to help us make that decision. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, but you're, and you're still teaching though, while you're writing. Yeah. I am the chair of English at Fordham University. So um, I was, I was talking actually to that, to the Wall Street Journal reporter. And I realized this really interesting thing was that when I first, before I got tenure, my first, second book came out, something like that. It was going to be in People Magazine. And they asked for my picture. And the chair of my department at that point said, do not give them your picture. Do not tell them your real name. You will not get tenure. 
And lo, these many years later, I am the chair of that same department. So I think that says something about where the reputation of romance has gone in the previous years. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I, I guess I'm a professor first, really. Okay. Thank you. Jane? Are you guys oh. back? Are you guys back? Or are you, like, how is virtual impacting your department? Virtual is incredibly exhausting, I can tell you that. Um, Fordham delayed until February 1st. We eliminated spring break because we're trying to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So this is irrelevant, but Fordham's actually going to be a vaccination point. We have our own refrigerator, so yay. Wow, what a world, I tell you. <laughs> so James, what led you to romance? Um, firstly, can I just apologize if I yawn? It's not because you guys are really boring me. It's just because it's very late here. So <laughs> if you keep yawning, I do apologize. Um, what led me to romance? I think unlike Vanessa, I wasn't very good at maths at school. I was, English was the subject I enjoyed. So I kind of always wanted to write in some capacity. Um, I thought I wanted to be a journalist and I did that for a few years. Um, and I like stories. So I, I started becoming um, a tour guide. I did walking tours. Um, I enjoyed like the history side of it and telling stories to people. And I started just writing, um, I had the idea of writing a novel. Um, I'm not sure necessarily why I picked romance. I don't know if it was just, I, don't, I think I probably grew up watching films like Hugh Grant films, you know, I was born in the 90s. So that was kind of what was big. Those early 2000 rom-coms were obviously all the rage at that point probably impacted me and I enjoyed the books like Nick Hornby, David Nichols, both very big writers over here. Um, yeah, and just kind of, that's the way it ended up really. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, Misha. Um, so I'm the daughter of immigrant parents and as the daughter of South Asian immigrant parents whose father is 13 generation physician, I had to get a career and because I passed out when I tried to dissect the fetal pig in college, um, law was it. <laughs> so <laughs> I went from pre-med to pre-law pretty quickly. And, um, but the whole time I, I was writing, I think one of the questions in the Q and A is how many of us actually read romance when we were kids. And um, I, I've started, my first romance was Nora Roberts in the summer after seventh grade that I snuck from the adult section of the public library. And um, I've always loved uh, these happily ever afters where I knew that, you know, joy was coming at the end, but I was just so invested in the journey to get there. And, um, and I think law, the reason why I was so attracted to it, um, other than the fact that I didn't have to do math, was um, that in the end, you want justice, you want a happily ever after um, for the side that you believe in. And so my, my two careers kind of intersected in that way. And um, I, I feel like with writing romance, you know, it was something that I, I always did as, you know, part of, part of my like passion projects for, you know, while I was going through law school and it wasn't really until after I graduated and I realized that, you know, I really want to do this full time because it's like not pursuing it is making me miserable. So that's when I went back to school because of course <laughs> that is what one does. And um, I got my MFA and I started, you know, really pursuing a full-time professional career as a romance writer. I was always a romance writer, but that was my, my end goal was to make it you know, my primary career versus, you know, something that I had to squeeze in between meetings and um, between, you know, meeting notes and briefs and things like that. So that is my, my romance journey. <laughs> it's a good one. Hey. I did read romance uh, sort of growing up, certainly in college, and I, I loved English like James. I liked English. I was drawn to the arts. My parents are both fine artists. My dad's a painter and they had a uh, uh, a sort of um, antique shop as I was growing up as well. So they would paint in the back because it was quiet and then they would sell things occasionally when people came in and liked it. And um, so I kind of grew up around auctions and things, but I went to uni and did um, English and French. So I loved the literature, I'd done all of that. But the antidote to that was, there's a lot of heavy stuff in like traditional literature. I mean, Eloisa knows this, right? I mean, it's beautiful and I love it and I, I adore it, but you do need sometimes literally like 10 mils and boon at the weekend or sorry, Harlequin as they have it in here. <laughs> 
which was just to kind of get over, I got so fed up of all the women dying, you know, which is a lot of sort of 19th century French literature and Russian literature, everyone's dying of consumption or misery or, you know, and I just needed something different. So I was a big reader, um, but I too, I did a stint in journalism, but after I came out of uh, a couple of years of that, my dad wanted to open an auction house and because he kind of moved from the antique shop to auctioneering and I'd gone to lots of auctions to buy stock for the uh, auction house, uh, for the um, for the shop. And he said, I want to open an auction house and I know paintings and furniture, but you can just do everything else. And I was like, stupidly not realizing that this was 90% of everything, which was like, you know, porcelain, pottery, silver, jewelry, metals, everything. So I went, yeah, sure. So I did a few crash courses and we basically opened the auction house. And I saw, 15 years of that, I basically learned on the job. It was amazing. And I saw all these incredible things. And obviously I had this love of history. And, but all the most important, all the interesting things for me were the, the stories behind the item. Cause you'd see this and it was a thing and it was beautiful, but mo more interesting was the person that came in and wanted to tell you the story of, oh, it was great aunt Sally's and she met Churchill and this was the cigar that he smoked or whatever it was. And that kind of added the value to the item and made it more interesting. And so when I, my husband's work moved us to the States I couldn't do auctioneering anymore and I missed that history bit and I'd always read historical romance and loved it and decided to have a go at writing my own so I'd, I'd read some pretty terrible ones that had zero historical accuracy whatsoever like literally electric light bulbs in the Regency which just drove me mad like I'm not I don't need absolute you know definite stickler for it but it would be just like a one minute google search to get that right so I thought I can't do any worse than the worst historical book out there surely so I'll give it a go so I mean the danger is obviously that I either go too far into describing the things because I get a bit geeky on the antique side of it or I assume that everyone already knows what the thing it is I'm looking at or describing and then I don't describe it at all and people are like what is a borderloo or what is a you know whatever it is I'm saying so yeah, but I mean, that's, I wrote what I wanted to read because I'd, I'd read a few people like Laura Kinsale and loved them and looked around for others like it and kind of couldn't find them and exhausted it. And I just thought, try it. What's the worst is it will be the worst book ever. And <laughs> it wasn't. So there we go. I can't find it. <laughs> so that's really inspiring, Kate, that um, you just wanted to make sure that yours was better than the worst. <laughs> yes. I set the bar really low and I wish I could remember which book it was that I threw across the room and said to my husband, my God, I could write better than that. And he goes, yeah, but I bet your pound you won't. And I said, well, I bet your pound I will. And uh, he, I did just despite him, but maybe he's cleverer. He knew, he knows me. He probably knew that I was too stubborn to give it, to, to not do it. So he probably nudged me in the right direction to give me something to do. Um, <laughs> But I finished it. That was my first book, which was a Renaissance Italy set book, not knowing anything about the romance uh, world, uh, knowing this is completely unsaleable, really. I mean, it's not everyone wants Regency or the big chunks of it, but it was fun. It was a, it was a fun thing to do. And I still like the book. I self-published it eventually after I got a, a publishing deal writing Regency. But, uh, yeah. Awesome. So my next question um, is leading into my third question, but the, the next question is um, why the perception that romance has. Why do you think that people have the perception of romance that they do? And I'm gonna start with Eloisa this time. Oh, you're muted. I think it's a real question these days what perception they have. Because I do think we are assuming a little bit that people mm -hmm. are looking down on romance and I'm not quite sure they actually are so much anymore. Um, that might be partly pandemic um, I think, Vanessa, it was your op-ed, uh, the flipping on the Bridgertons, and you said it, it landed in the exact perfect time. I mean, Bridgerton is this amazing series. It did land in the exact perfect time, and we do all want to escape. I got to say, James and Kate, especially if you're in America right now, because, you know, we're adding politics to everything else. So I... I think it's an interesting question. I think that the, the value of romance is rising as a genre. And I think people are coming to respect it a great deal more. If we're looking historically, I would say that there's a great deal of misogyny involved in the fact that people denigrated romance as something that would, um, that simply existed to somehow excite women, that it was, um, that it was just erotica written down or that uh, it was all you know, where do you find your formulas? A question I used to be asked a lot. I'm never asked anymore. So I think we're in a rapidly shifting period in terms of assessment of romance. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the next five years. Thank you. Uh, James, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, it's difficult. As I said, it's kind of what is the perception now. It's hard to to comment on. Um, I suppose you know everyone wants a bit of escapism in their life, don't they? Certainly, you know. I know you're saying obviously the states has got it far worse than we do here right now, but just generally, everyone in the world probably wants some escapism those last twelve months. And you know, I think people will be turning to romance books for that kind of escapism, which it offers. Um, so hopefully, if anything good can come of the last twelve months, that'll be that'd be good for us. Um, yeah, I suppose any time will tell. Really, what happens? Mm -hmm. uh, let me see, Misha. Um, so I was I was just looking it up to make sure I had the title right. Maya Rodale wrote a really great book called Dangerous Book for Girls, which kind of assesses the reputation of romance and where where the reputation came from and and kind of some of the um, and she's done a lot of research on it and so I highly recommend that for anyone who's really interested in the evolution of the reputation of romance um, but I I agree with uh, I agree with Eloise and I agree with James that you know the the reputation for romance has come a long way from from where we were even when I started writing you know 12 years ago 13 years ago and um, I'm hoping that will, it will continue to evolve. And I think part of that is access to information, access to authors, access to people who are writing think pieces on, on topics in romance, authors who are writing real world, um, like critical, P, uh, uh, doing critical analysis in the text of their novels that you know are getting a lot more visibility from people outside of romance because oftentimes in romance you're in an echo chamber so you know outside of romance is now seeing that as well I, th I think all of that is just contributing to the evolution of you know positive uh, views on on the on the genre so I'm I'm grateful for that but I will also say that you know you will always get those individuals who look down on the genre and I am incredibly passionate about you know protecting romance so I'm so cutthroat about it so I, I feel like every once in a while you'll see like authors get like that just because you know we're we've been in this journey and you know we still although we have a little bit more to go like we've been at it for a while trying to improve the genre's reputation oh that's true um Kate I think romance romance has always been around, right? It's not a new thing, but most of the kind of accepted ones were mainly, as, as Eloisa said, you know, written by men. And that was somehow kind of easier for people to digest. So you get, I was thinking the other day, Count of Monte Cristo is, for me, it's an adventure romance, but it's still a, a romance, right? And there are romances all through history, literally like the French, you know, there were Romain de Clé and things like that. There were lots of them. But I think the fact that mainly more recently, the ones that were written by women was kind of a bit of an issue because it was kind of denigrated generally as women in general were denigrated. So yeah, I mean, I'm glad to be living and writing in these times where it is getting to be much more mainstream and things like Bridgerton coming on the stream can only can only help us, right? It's a, it's a rising tide. And even if people have issues with that and it's not perfect, nothing is perfect, but at least it's a step forward in the right direction of inclusivity and getting the idea that people, everyone deserves happy endings and that it's fine to admit that you like this. Like in, in TV, romance is, is much more acceptable. Like uh, most of the TV shows you think, you know, even Game of Thrones, a lot of them get, not many of them get happy endings, but you're still rooting for the happy endings. In. And that's kind of fine for people to say, oh yeah, I like the happy ending in the TV series, but maybe not so much in the book. So I think we're moving, hopefully we're moving towards that as it being fine to just, you know, be on the tube and reading a historical romance is not something embarrassing. Um, Kindle is doing a lot for us as well because you don't have to have those as much as I love bodice ripping covers and I want them for my own books um, Kindle you could be reading anything you know you can pretend you're reading Tolstoy but in fact you're reading Fifty Shades and I think that's helped people's kind of you know they're still a bit embarrassed I think a few people to to read it but yeah romance writers are loud and proud about shouting about how much it is and I, I'm always amazed by their quality and their how brilliant most of my fellow writers are like they have PhDs or they're doctorates or they're you know they're really really intelligent people and I always shout about it you know I, I shove romance books at everyone I meet and they probably hate me for it but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, Vanessa? Well, I, I, mean, I think everybody's really you know said everything on it. Um, we come from a past where misogyny has said because it's mostly written by women 
there's some how it's devalued. And I think the present times of more people uh, publishing, more people gaining access to have these different types and represent representations of who gets to have a happy ever after has really impacted the landscape. And then you go into this time of COVID and, and political unrest and people just want something safe and calm and beautiful. And so you see a very much a new appreciation for something with a guarantee happy ever after. And so I think that is really uh, makes things like Bridgerton so exciting and it makes everybody reaching and, and looking with new appreciation at romance books. Mm -hmm. The question came up for me because about a year and a half ago, somebody, I told somebody I read romance and they said, oh, I've never met anybody who admitted to reading romance. And this was, you know, just a year and a half ago. And I was really uh, uh, taken aback by that. So um, my next question is, um, is that because of those old, old and changing perceptions, do you think that there are, um, that those are barriers for somebody wanting to write romance? And I'm going to start with James because you're this the, the the book coming out at the flip side is your first book. So was that in any way a, a thought for you when you started writing? I don't know when I if I started writing it was a barrier, but then I'm not sure if I necessarily set out as I said to write a romance. I'm not sure if I was like this is what I'm going to do. I think it probably became a romance. I think I've certainly found maybe a barrier afterwards. And that kind of you know we're saying obviously it used to be men who wrote romance, and then it became you know, traditionally women who wrote it, and it's quite rare to have a man write it now. And certainly you still have lots of those attitudes. You know, certainly I've told people I've written this book and they say, oh, what is it? You know, it's like a rom-com. And I usually get the response, oh, I'll buy it for my wife or I'll buy it for my girlfriend, that kind of thing, rather than buying it for themselves. Um, and I work in a school, an all boys school. And certainly I think the boys in the school found it strange that I was writing a romantic book. So certainly there is that barrier. I think what Kate said about um, Kindle and also audiobooks, so well, I think probably changing it slightly, you know, people can read or listen to the books they want without other people judging them, which is probably improving the situation. Um, yeah, it's been interesting kind of filled in people's reactions to it. Mm -hmm. Misha? I can't remember if I'm going in the right order, but. <laughs> Sorry, Mina, can you repeat the question? I'm like I was just an wondering. About, I was hard. wondering um, because of those perceptions or perceived perceptions, if you think that um, becoming a romance writer is uh, it, it, it can be a barrier to becoming a romance writer. Um, and I'm seeing people in the chat writing their experience with people telling them, you know, oh, you know, I thought you were smart, but now I realize you read romance books, and, you know, things like that. So um, as a reader, it certainly can be a little bit of a, a barrier. I mean, I've been reading romance for so long. I think that any microaggressions, I've kind of just like have gone straight over my head because I'm so passionate about it. And as a writer, I knew that this is exactly what I wanted to do, you know, um, and what I wanted to write. And um, although I had, you know, traditional parents, we, I also come from a culture that's really rich in happily ever afters. Like, every Bolly movie, Bollywood movie that you would see has a happily ever after and a romance in it. And, and, you know, that's what I grew up on. And that's, you know, what, whenever someone tells a story, you know, when we have family all over and we're all talking, like the expectation is happily ever after. So I don't think that I, I really necessarily faced barriers in my journey as a writer. And, you know, if, as a reader, I've ever faced microaggressions. I mean, I did work at, I, I have worked at, although, you know, the tech industry claims to be liberal, there, <laughs> there are quite a few conservative minds out there, uh, like, and who have very um, regressive opinions about, you know, things like <laughs> romance novels. I don't think it's ever let me stop in my, has ever stopped me in my journey because it brings me happiness and it's honestly their problem, not mine. <laughs> So. <laughs> I agree with that. Uh, Kate? Yeah, I mean, I, 
I had this previous career and James probably has seen me on the TV in England. I used, to, I'm, as part of my auctioneering, I used to be on some of the TV shows. It's like a bit like Antiques Roadshow, but as the on-screen valuer. So I did three different shows and I'm pretty much still popping up 10 years later, always on the TV. And millions of people watch these shows. So in England, I'm known as Kate Bateman, the antiques appraiser, right? I mean, James, you've probably seen Flog It and Bargain Hunt and stuff, right? Um, so when I went to something different, that was obviously, I, I got, you know, the tabloid press did a few things when it, my first book came out and they rang me up and said, I said, this is not, you know, X-rated erotica. This is just a romance book. It's historical. It's history. It's not historical fiction, though. It is a romance book. And I was unashamed of that. And yet I still got the Daily Mail sidebar of shame, you know, Kate Bateman, Antiques Honey writes, you know, X-rated erotica. I'm like, oh, my God, really? And it was, you know, 15 minutes of stupidity. But that's still a very prevailing Thing. And so now I've got this weird dichotomy of people who now follow me for antiques geekiness, but also I've got people that only know me as a, as a romance writer. And I try and keep those worlds, they're fairly close, and I write about the things that I'm, you know, I post about antiques in my books and vice versa. But um, it's a bit, it is a bit weird because it, it, people don't expect that. They expect you to have one career. And I probably, Eloisa has the same thing, you know, you've got this public professorial kind of, you know, feeling, and then you've got your persona as the antiques I mean as, as the um, romance writer and it's kind of like having two different lives and so it, it still does put people off I think and some people absolutely do not want on my timeline if they're following me for the antiques stuff they're horrified by the romance and they'll quite happily tell me can't you have a separate profile for that so I'm like well no because this is me I like both of those things and if you don't like that then don't follow me <laughs> you know but yeah I think it does it is scary for people coming into it and certainly you know for, for men, James, I mean, brilliant that you're out there doing it because we need every single perspective. I mean, it's not, we talk a lot about sort of racial diversity and cultural diversity, but also there's, you know, um, male, female diversity and LGBTQ diversity. And I can't write that story. I can't write a story from your male point of view and I wouldn't be good at it and I wouldn't want to, but we absolutely need it. And there's room at the table for every pers you know, perspective of that. So I'm glad that you are joining in these discussions and actually Yay, writing books. People out there will read it if you write it. You've just got to get people to write it. That's awesome. Thank you, Kate. Eloisa? Well, I, my, what I'm going to say fits in perfectly with Kate because I actually didn't know James. So I just looked this up. <laughs> this look backwards to you guys? No, it's right. It's, it's, it's the new book, right, James? So yep. flip side, it looks incredibly fun. Um, buy in the U.S., at utterly adorable and romantic, says somebody or other. The one book everyone wants to read, says someone else. So, you know, bravo. I, that's fantastic. I'm totally going to read it. Um, I think it was hard for me to start romance because, you know, you've heard like uh, my first book was written in 99. So my first book came out in hardcover in 2000. And, um, you know, it's been a long time. There's been a lot of changes in the, in the, and I've had a lot of really weird things said to me. And I do think that if you're going to write fiction, and I would say this just from having run creative writing at Fordham for quite a while now, uh, if you're going to write fiction, I don't care what genre you're in, people are going to come up and say really shitty things to you. You know, you think if you're in literary fiction that they would be more respectful? No, they won't. They'll just be mean in a different way. So I... I would encourage everyone out there who's thinking of writing something, just go ahead and write it, even if it's poetry. Go after Kate. You can probably do better than the worst that's out there, or you could be a number one bestseller like Kate. So, hey, you know, <laughs> somewhere in between. Thank you so much for that. Vanessa, I think I made you last last time. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think, okay. So I, I thought we, did this question. Are we on a new question? Oh, did I start with you? Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, someone's um, asking if my husband ever paid me the dollar or the pound, actually. No, he, he hasn't ever. And I plan to frame it if he ever doesn't get him to sign it. But he it's what, how many years? 11 years now. No, he has not, dear reader. I will <laughs> definitely post about it if he does, ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, somebody says charge him interest. <laughs> Um, okay, so good. I'm, I'm sort of on track here. Um, Shane asks, when did you know when romance writing was your priority? And how long did you or have you done both? Um, and I think I'm starting with uh, Misha this time. Um, oh, gosh. So 
It's a good question. Um, I, I wrote, I read romance. I wrote romance as like my passion projects while I was pursuing a career in law um, and while I was working. But right after I graduated law school was when I was, it was like 2010. And I, it was like month three on my new job where I was commuting into Manhattan. And uh, I was working these incredibly long hours and I was just like, this sucks so much. And um, I pulled out a piece of paper and I wrote a 10 year plan. And uh, I'm a true Taurus, like every, I'm very like driven and stubborn and, you know, so um, with true Taurus energy, I wrote my 10 year plan. And in 10 years, I wanted to have a publishing contract and I wanted to be in a position where I could leave my day job and either consult or teach on the side and, and publish books. And um, in that 10 year plan, um, I knew that I was gonna have to juggle both. So for 10 years, I was writing and I was working and I would write on my phone. I'd get up at four in the morning to write if I had to meet deadlines. I would write on the train back from New York. I would constantly be working. And uh, 10 years to the day, uh, I <laughs> quit my job and I consult and I'm a graduate advisor <laughs> for my MFA program. So I would say that 10 years is when I, I did both. Hey. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I muted myself for a second. Wow. Um, Kate. I wish I was that organized. I'm just in awe of Nisha. I mean, I have no plan for what's for dinner today, let alone 10 years time, my God. Um, okay, so I always, wait, I, what even was the question? I'm just, I'm just blown away by the, <laughs> she lost me on. Her, I mean, I hear you with the terrible job because before I did the auction house, the, yes, I had done some pretty terrible jobs. Um, what, what was the question? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, when did you know when romance writing was your priority? Romance. Uh, it was a forced move because I, as much as I love the auction house, uh, I, we, my husband's work brought us here to the States, uh, which is officially for a three years maximum, maximum stay. So I left the auction house. I said, oh, I'll be back in three years, you know, 24 months if it's two, you, you, you won't miss me. And then I'm now here 11 years later. So we kind of got the green card and ended up staying and had an extra kid and a dog and everything. So, yes, yeah, so it, I, the auctioneering rules are different in, in America and I can't, I couldn't be bothered to go back to school. I'm really lazy and, and learn all the specific, you know, rules for auctioning here and getting my other qualifications. So that was it. It was sink or swim. I had to do something. And with three kids, I couldn't really go out and do a nine to five. Um, but I wanted to do something that might officially owe me some money at some point um, and I loved the writing it wasn't my first book though I had back in England I had been writing and I ironically it was just before Harry Potter came out and I looked and thought hey, it's a real I, I like things like the worst witch I don't know if you've heard, heard that maybe James says that the worst witch and there's a whole bunch of these really great series and I was like there's a real gap of that kind of magical middle grade market and I'd written like a quantum leap for kids and sent it off to an English publisher and just got it you know accepted when I moved and then I got pregnant and it, nothing happened but then that was the thing to say, well, I can clearly finish a book. It was kind of an exercise of, can I write a 70,000 word book? And I could. And then I came and thought, why, you know, then that fell by the wayside. And I thought, well, I, I really want to write romance because that's what I want to read. And it can't be the worst book ever written. So what the heck? So yeah, I was probably, it must be nine years ago, I think, nine years ago that I started seriously pursuing it. Yeah. Oh, so not that far behind Nisha. <laughs> no, but zero plan of, in all of that. It was like, can I write a book? Can I, you know, every step was like, oh, someone liked it. Oh, I've got a contract. Oh, I've got an agent. You know, that it was, it was baby steps and I never really expected it, but it's great to be here. <laughs> Vanessa? Um, for me, very different than these two. Um, I was in high tech, working at a startup, um, uh, engineering. I was, uh, had a team that we were working on trying to get a product to market. And Lord, hold, my husband got me pregnant. <laughs> God, right? He got me pregnant, right? Um, and unfortunately, it was a difficult pregnancy. And the doctor sat me down and he's, he's like, you have two outcomes if you do not sit down and do nothing for the next six months. And so I pulled out 
notebooks that I'd been journaling from uh, back in high school. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And so I started working on uh, what would end up being my very first uh, published book, Madeline's Protector. But it was the change of you have to do something else if you want everything to go well. My daughter is healthy, wonderful, blessing of my life, greatest decision. But that was the turning point for me, taking me out of one um, deadline filled uh, rat race into another deadline filled rat race. But I could sit down and do it. <laughs> but you kept, but you kept your software, or did you start a software company? I started a software you? company later. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay, so high achieving, all of you. <laughs> Eloisa. Um, I, uh, well, you know, I didn't, I'm, st I'm still professor. I'm a Shakespeare professor. So I can't say there was a moment in which romance got immediacy. I will say though that I, someone has asked in the chat whether we had an MFA. I had nothing. In fact, I never took a writing class. I still have never taken a writing class. So I think that romance is one of the great meritocracies, you know, where it's like, it's like watching Hell's Kitchen, right? These people have not been to a fancy French cooking school and yet here they are and they, they end up running one of Gordon Ramsay's, you know, restaurants or whatever. Um, I felt that romance was somewhere where you didn't have to have that education. And so I jumped into it and I wrote frankly to pay off my student loans. I had like Vanessa, I'd had one baby. It was very, very, difficult. I was in the hospital for two and a half months with Luca and um, I wanted another baby and my husband was like, forget it. You have too many student loans. And by the way, you were in the hospital and you know, no. And I said, I'll pay off those student loans. And I paid them off with a romance. I turned the romance in and found out I was pregnant, um, you know, a couple of months later and, and the, the contract paid off my student loans. So she was born though at 24 weeks because everything doesn't work out, but she is the person, in case you can hear, yelling at Alexa and cooking in the kitchen. So she's like <laughs> Vanessa's daughter, absolutely fine. Great, everything's going fine, so. Yeah, so it's interesting that um, some of you had to like almost be forced to stop what you were doing to like make a little switch or like look at things differently. Yeah. Um, James, um, I forgot the question too, but. <laughs> I'm hoping you were paying attention. Uh, um, yes, yeah, so obviously it's slightly different because obviously this is my debut. So it's mm -hmm. obviously I'm still doing my job and, you know, I haven't made a conscious decision to to stop that at this point. But I suppose I have made probably sacrifices related to the book in the last few years. You know, I took jobs which were part time so that I'd have time to write and dedicate time to write. And certainly that was, you know, a risk as I saw like friends, you know, getting well-paid jobs and going off doing fancy jobs and I was being a tour guide being paid what people think the tour's worth and again you know equivalent like five dollars for a two-hour tour just so I'd have the time to write it's obviously a risk doing it um but it's paid off hopefully um and yeah going forward we'll see what happens but um but I think I quite like actually having a job you know a proper normal job as well just to get inspiration I feel I wouldn't be someone who's good to just writing all day. I think I get very bored quickly and I kind of need that inspiration. I need interaction with people to, to inspire it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that makes sense because that's, sometimes people get their best ideas from being interacting and not just writing, right? Um, Mary Alice has this really good question. Um, many of the writers have dual lives with their careers. I'm curious if or how they find that romance helps them with their other career. And I think we're starting with Kate this time. Well, they're both about stories, right? That's the thing. I mean, every item that comes in, we call it in, in the romance, in, in the antiques trade, it's like the provenance, it's the background, what's the story? And it adds value. And I think that's a really interesting concept. So you could, ha you could have a ring and it's just a ring. It's like this much gold and a diamond and a thing. And it's worth X amount for the like the base metals. But then if that ring was like Napoleon's wedding ring, or, you know, if it's got that story, it's suddenly not even 10, it's 100 times more expensive. And nothing's changed. It's just the story behind it that's added that value. And I think I'm just fascinated by that concept. Like, people really value stories, like from the first cave paintings on a wall, it's a story, right? It's somebody telling some bit of information that's to entertain or inform somebody. And so it's, I think it's vital. And so 
in the antiques thing, I'm always asking about people, the provenance, the, the history, the story behind their item. And I guess that's what interests me when I'm doing research for my books is I, I tend to use a kernel of some weird but fantastically fun historical fact that's been lost or you've discovered and I, you find it like a little nugget and you're like that is so cool I really want to put that in a book and then that's where it grows I mean I know Vanessa's the same she, you've based it on real people I mean they're slightly fictionalized but there are bits of all of the books that have that in and that's where the interest comes for me I mean I I am now right yeah I am full-time writing I do very small amount of consultancy for the antiques on the side but um that's how it's informed me. It's that they're still both about stories and about discovering interesting things and things that make me think or discover something I didn't know before. Like, I'm all about history by stealth. If I can make my reader know one more thing that they didn't know about whatever time period, just, just in there anyway, after one of my books, as well as having a decent happy ever after, then I've done my job as a historical romance writer. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Vanessa? Like Kate said, um, I love. I'm, I'm a. Uh, I would call myself an amateur historian, but the uh, from the tech side, I'm always asking first principle questions. How did they? How would you? Uh, why would you? And leading down that rabbit hole because even just the basic things of of how would someone um, get gloves made in 1813, right? You know, where would they go? How, what would be the fabrics look like? So it's this, this process of asking these, for, uh, you know, I call them level one, level two, and level three questions, going through that process on almost every stage has helped me really dig into the history um, and to be able to bring back, because actually like Kate said it as well, I want my readers to come away with a, an, an appreciation of the history um, I want their eyes open with things they've never thought of or, or never even uh, imagined was possible. I, I try and bring in real people, um, you know, sometimes except for one person, I try to protect the innocent because he's not innocent at all. And he's going down at all three, but that's a whole nother story. Um, but, you know, I, I, want you, I want you to leave with, first and foremost, a happy ever after. Number two, I'm gonna show you a new perspective, something you didn't think about. And three, there'll be a hidden nugget of hidden of history that's been hidden or whitewashed or just completely ignored in my book so that you get a bigger perspective of the world. Thank you. Although I think the question is, does your writing help your other career, like your software career? Oh, absolutely and not. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a one-way program, one-way gating program. It's totally, the engineering side helps the writing. The writing side takes away from the engineering side. There's nothing it gives. Gotcha. <laughs> but I liked your first answer better anyway, so it doesn't, you know, that's fine. I can't um, help having that kind of day. can't remember what you <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> um, Eloisa. Um, for me, it does. I'm a Shakespeare professor, so that means that I teach... I would say I often teach Shakespeare and pop culture, but I often teach the basic Shakespeare lecture. And I don't know, probably none of you have thought about Othello in a long time, but when you read it in high school, probably your teacher did not point out to you the fact that there's a major time problem in Othello. None of the things that Othello is being accused of, actually there wasn't time for them to have to happen, right? And so it's been really great for me as a writer to realize how Shakespeare pulled some things back and brought things forward to make the reader, or in this place, the audience, not realize that what he was talking about was total crap and it could not happen, right? That, that you know, Iago's just completely full of it and, and Othello was crazy, but he, he manipulated it and that, and it's been really fun to talk to classrooms about how you do that. And they love that because, they don't want to have the Shakespeare lecture that they had in high school, right? They would much prefer to hear about Shakespeare as an actual working author who had to make this work, who wanted to do this and wanted to do that. And those two things were in opposition. So he finessed it. And I can pull that apart because it's something that having been a writer and moving away from, you know, I, I, I got my MPhil in Oxford, I got my PhD here. I have a very standard scholarly background, right? But writing has brought a whole different layer. And I would say, given me a complete 
fearless attitude towards Shakespeare, which has been fun for everybody, I think on both sides, so. That's awesome considering Shakespeare scares the crap out of me. So, okay. <laughs> no reason to. I'll have to take one of your classes. Um, James. Yeah, so cer certainly my other careers have certainly helped my writing like Vanessa, I've probably stolen loads of real life characters and put them in the book. I'm trying to think of how writing helps of a career, my actual career. I think there's probably lots of things as a writer you learn apart from the obvious, you know, like how to deal with criticism from your editor, how to do social media marketing, all these kind of various skills you probably pick up along the way, maybe you don't realize, but you know, they're probably quite good, you know, to go on a CV or to help you in a certain way. Um, I think they help in my, in my role. Thank you, uh, Nisha. Um, so right now I'm consulting. I by the end of my like ten year career, I was working in diversity, equity, and inclusion organizations and tech companies, and so I consult developing DEI programs. And um, part of that is really helping people like uh, develop an understanding of other points of view and culture and backgrounds and the social justice crisis that we currently have. And um, I have to say that has definitely transformed my work in different ways. Um, the very first book I wrote, my so-called Bollywood life was a young adult novel. And I, I wanted to write a story about Brown Joy because you know, South Asian stories are grief and poverty. And, you know, it's very much, sorry, Lizzie Bennett is just wants to say hello. She's, she's, very, <laughs> she's very excited. Um, but, um, and, uh, and I wanted to write a story where my, my um, history and my culture and the way that I grew up was, you know, was, was happy. And um, that was represented on the page. And the further I kind of, went down this road into DEI and to my um, diversity, equity, inclusion, development career path, the more I have to say those um, inequities that exist today in our world, um, I try to address them and, um, and showcase the nuance um, between cultures that, um, that, exist, you know, in, in my books, uh, and I, I try to put it in my books. So like my, my adult romance series, my adult romance trilogy with Avon, um, the Singh family trilogy um, is about a family of, you know, Punjabi sons um, who are trying to protect their, their father's company from this hostile takeover. And a lot of the conversations that happen that may not necessarily be, have a lot of time on the page, but they deal with, you know, relationships between people that um, I think that they they have more meaning for me just because um, in my DEI work I'm I'm learning about communication and relationships in different ways. So it's a long-winded way of saying yes, it does affect my <laughs> the way that I work. <laughs> well, I would I would think that given how we're trying to have more diversity or, or showcase more diversity within our romance books that the work that you do in EDI would be super important um, to make sure that it's representative and, um, mm -hmm. and also true to the reality of actual South Indian people's lives. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. I think, you know, the other thing is though with DEI that's so important is that, you know, there's like South, like South Asian culture is like, it's huge. It, there's so much to it. There's so many, I mean, I was on a Zoom call with 12 other South Asian writers a couple days ago and every single one of us is from a different area in India and every single one of us grew up in a different way. And so I try to make sure that I highlight that in the stories that I tell. And I don't think that would have been something that was top of mind if I hadn't really worked in DEI and was working with, you know, uh, best in class research and studies and trying to really engage these organizations that are influencing like 600, and, like 6,500 6, people to 165,000 people. Like when you, when you get on a scale that big, you have to really start thinking about your messaging and the way that you develop 
um, you know, your, your message about nuance. So, so that's what's really, I think, kind of come up in my stories, the nuance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I've seen that in so many books um, of all of the, uh, all of all of you writers that, that ha has really given me hope for the future of romance. <laughs> um, this is an interest, an interesting question too um, from Misty, um, because you guys have been writing, you know, Eloise, you've been writing for so many years. James's new book has just come out, you know, so there's a range um, about, she asked, how scary was it to, for you to submit your first novel to a, an editor or a publisher? And the, the reason I picked that question was because, because of the range of time that you guys have been writing, but also the changes we just talked about in the perception of romance over the years. So I am gonna start with you, Eloisa, about that question. Like when you first started, how hard was that? Well, my first novel was about 600 pages long. It, um, the heroine fell in love with two different shakes. She fell off the, uh, <laughs> the river into the Seine when she was in France. And then she went to an unnamed Arabic speaking country and um, she had a lesbian love scene in a tent. It was everything from my point of view. And my boyfriend at that time was working for a bank. So he gave it to his, um, you know, his assistant and she Xeroxed the whole thing and sent out to everybody in the, what was then the, um, the publisher's marketplace. So my favorite rejection letter is from the Sierra Club. And it says that they thought it was very frisky, but it wasn't in their line. So it's one of my favorite things in the world is that letter. But years later, my mom was uh, using them as, re as paper. She, would, she was an early recycler. So she would just rip open one of these packets that had been sent back because they used to resend back all the hundreds of pages and she would use it and then she would reuse the pages because she was actually a published short story writer and novelist and I was off at Oxford doing my MPhil and she she called me and she was like I'm so sorry Harlequin says that if you delete one shake and lesbian sex and they don't like the sen and they think that you know da, 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 they might consider publishing it but but then I was already into something else so but you know what that did is it gave me the sense, like even if you're totally wrong with everything, as long as you have a backbone of a story, you can write, you shouldn't be afraid in my view. I mean, when I came around, I wrote my second book, I still didn't know what I was doing. So I took what I thought was the sexiest chapter, which was the sex scene, and I attached it to five, you know, I wrote to five different agents. And I started at the back of the agent's book, because by then I'd figured out you should have an agent. So I wrote this letter and I attached the sex scene and I sent it off to five. And I figured when it came back, I would send it out to another five. And so Kim Witherspoon, who was one of the original five, is still my agent all these years later. She took a flyer on an, an author who sent her this absurd letter with a sex scene attached and she had no romance. That's all, she'd only done literature to that point. And, you know, I think that, I think that if any of you are thinking of writing, you should just give it a shot because I think romance is someplace where there is a space without an MFA. Your letter doesn't have to say, I went to Iowa writing workshop. It doesn't have to say anything like that. It just has to be lively. That's it, lively. So that's my great. Answer. Thank you. That is a great answer. James. Yeah, obviously, I think everyone's always afraid of failure and rejection in whatever part of life. So obviously submitting something which you spent you know, probably years writing, curating, and you, that you think is good, that you're proud of, is always just that, that worry that someone's going to turn around and say, actually, this is awful. Um, and I think it's just every stage you get to. It's like, you know, you come up with a, what you think is a good idea for a novel, you finish the novel, you're like, yes, I've written the novel. Then you've got to get an agent. Then you think, yes, I've made it now. Then you've got to send it to a publisher. And then the rejections come in first. And it's just the fact that you could have spent all these years, you got that far, and then it might not happen even at that point. So obviously, yes, it's, it's definitely scary. Um, I suppose though, unless you actually submit it, you're never gonna know, are you? You know, I was on a writing course, which gave me a bit of confidence. I did like a six month course. Um, and I know friends on the course who have written what I think are very good novels, but they're too scared to actually take that jump and submit it. But then you're never going to get anywhere. So I suppose you just have to take that plunge at some point and send it off. And fingers crossed it, you know, I think probably is probably an element of luck as well and timing. 
that it lands on the right person's desk on the right day. Um, yeah. But as a as a, a male writer writing romance, was it um, a little bit harder for you to, um, or more scary for you? Do you think to um, submit a romance book? Um, I don't know. Again, I don't think I necessarily thought about it really. Um, I, I I was quite brave. So the the premise of the book is about somebody flips a coin for all their decisions. And I sent it off with the email header as Tosser. That was my working title for it here. Um, so that kind of caught people's attention. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I suppose maybe I thought it might help me that it was a bit more, it might stand out more that I was a male author writing it. But I'm not sure I necessarily thought about it that much. Mm. Oh, that's good. Nisha? Um, I, I mean, Taurus energy. I was fearless. I just, I got it done. I did my research. I sent it out without even thinking about it. And when that first rejection came back in, I was like, you know what? It's okay. There's going to be some person who's going to say yes. So I kept going. I have to say though, that like that fearlessness has definitely changed over the years because the more you know about the industry, the more you become more cautious and be, become a little bit more scared. And sometimes it's hard to remember how fearless I used to be and like try to channel that energy. Um, but I encourage every one of you to also try to be just a tad bit fearless when you send out your first book and you send out your first manuscript, as long as you believe in the book and you believe it's the best thing you could possibly write. And like, it's the strongest book and you know, there's no book that's ever going to be perfect. So don't wait for it to be perfect, but you know, just, I would just say, try to channel as much fearlessness as you can in that moment to send it out. Um, and, you know, it's a journey. It's that, that was the one of the first things that I, I met a group of romance writers when I was, I was very young. And one of them said to me, kid, it's a journey. <laughs> and I've always kept that in my head. Like if I get a rejection, you know that you just got to keep going because even, you know, five, books in with a contract for four more, I, I know that like, there's still possibilities for rejection and, you know, people who just aren't going to connect with your story. So you just have to keep going. There will be readers, there will be people who love you and connect with you and connect with your stories and your words. Thank you. But your, your first book was um, my so called Bollywood life, right? And so that was more of a YA book. Was that a maybe an e not easier, but like, was that a little less scary to do a YA book and then do a full-fledged romance book? Well, so in all transparency, my first story was actually a novella that was published with the Wild Rose Press under a pseudonym that oh. is, I've now since gotten the rights back and I've, I've quietly put it under the bed and <laughs> maybe one day I will pull it back out. But when I went out with my so-called Bollywood Life, which I, I published after my MFA, um, I, I, I still had quite a bit of fearlessness at that time, but what the YA industry is very different than romance, but also they have like a lot of similarities in, in like process and, you know, approach. But, um, I think there's like it's a, there's a little bit more of a frenzy. I hate that. I hate to say it that way, but there's a little bit more of frenzy when it comes to YA. It's like, you know, these are the books that are, are doing really well. And this is what we want. And this is the only thing we want. And <laughs> this is how we're going to approach it. So sometimes you have to kind of ignore that noise and just like put out a book that you really, you really believe in and say like, well, this is the book I'm selling. And so that's kind of what I did at the time, because I don't think I, I went out, I think kind of like at the tail end of when vampires were popular. And so my agent's like, I'm just letting you know, every, every editor I've talked to is looking for vampires. And I'm like, I'm not writing a vampire story right now. I'm sorry. I'm writing about a, a girl who was obsessed with Bollywood movies. We're just going to have to go with it and see what happens. And that's kind of the, like the, the, the setup that I had when I, when I went out with my first YA. Thank you. Uh, Kate. Was a part of publication no well, that was the I think I, I didn't start writing until I was quite old, quite a bit older so I, if I think I would have been a bit too scared at 20 and I thought I might have thought I didn't know enough about life to actually have enough authority to write about a romance and things like that so I think maybe the fact that I was sort of 35 or 36 when I first started was probably a good thing 
for me. But I only set out with the goal that if I got this book published, if I if one person read it and enjoyed it, then I and then my job was done, right? I have increased the sum of human happiness by one. So yay, that's the whole point of romance, right? So I I got published the backwards way in that I'd written the book and it won a contest, and from that I got a, an ask for um, a full manuscript request from it was then Random House. I give it a random house. Uh, and then I rang up an agent and said, can I, can I, I think I need an agent. I've got someone asking for it. And of course, then they're like, yes, we'll take your 15%. Of course, I will be your agent, of course. Um, and she's still my agent and she's more than paid for herself. But so that was, that was backwards. But I have a post-it note on, on above my computer. And one of my favorite books, historicals is um, Lord of Scoundrels by Loretta Chase. Oh. And I read somewhere that that was her, either her seventh or her ninth book. And I've got that. It says LOS is, is her seventh book or ninth book or whatever it is and that gave me hope because I'm like I can write six other books that are terrible I, you know and I can still break out with book number seven and I can still get better so I'm still there you know that's you can always improve right so the first book is not going to be your best book and if anyone's worried just send it out what's the worst that can happen is you get rejected you know and I've got three children who reject me all the time a like hundred times a day and I've kind of got used to it um, and you do get a thicker skin I mean it's still horrible to get edits back. I've just got edits back on my new book of a new series. And I still kind of quietly rot in a corner, you know, for a day and can't stand it. And then after you get over it, you're like, yeah, she's probably got a point that chapter has to go. And, you know, so you, you, you kind of get better at it at, at accepting rejection. But even a rejection letter, like if you've got a rejection letter, you're a real author. Like everyone's, you know, heavy, we got thousands of them. You know, everyone got rejected. So. I'm all, I'm all for that. Just, just do it. Like, what's the worst that can happen is, you, you know, self-publish it if you can't get it. I mean, that's a huge thing now. It wasn't 10 years ago, but now you can self-publish on so many platforms. You can do it as serializations, you know, Wattpad, things like that. There's so many ways that you can get your stuff out there, that it's not this, you must have a traditional publishing path and you must get one of the big five. And that is the be all and end all. Um, the options are so much better now, I think, to enter the romance market. So do it. If you're out there, do it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do it, then we will read it. <laughs> yes. Build it. Oh, oh. <laughs> I think we've heard some really great stories. I don't have that great story. Oh. I don't. So remember the manuscript? So we, we ripped this manuscript up. And the problem with being successful in other careers you assume you're going to be successful in other things. So, and you pass it around to your friends who don't, you know, who just read books and you're writing towards these books that might be older, you know, where things like head hopping and, and all this sort of fun stuff was, you know, acceptable. And they are loving it because they're just your friends and they're just really saying it's really great. So I go to this conference and I've always been able to pitch very well. So I get a, a publisher who's excited about it but they will only look at the book if it's agented. But she liked the concept so much that she got one of the top agents in, um, in romance, uh, CBA romance to, uh, to take a look at it. So I'm excited because I'm like, this is it, this is gonna do, I don't hear anything. And so I reach out and then I get this, I get a, a you know, the vanilla letter saying, you know, it just wasn't working out. And I ask a couple more questions. And I get this statement back of, uh, I've worked with people like you. Uh, you'll never get it. You have some great ideas. You need to get a co-writer because this agent didn't think that me would be able to master the craft and be able to tell stories in the Regency because she didn't think they would be published. She didn't think, she didn't know the history. So she didn't assume that I actually had a footing in this history. And so for about a month, I drank serious gutter water because mm -hmm. yeah, at this point, I'm you know, excited about writing. I love this story. And you know, the whole carpet is pulled out from under you. But I had a friend who said, if you believe that this is what you're called to do, if you really believe in it, why are you gonna let one person say no? And I was like, you know what? That's kind of true. So I rewrote this manuscript 125 times, 125 times, fixed everything, got it all ship shape. And it was the very first uh, uh, book, my very first traditionally published book. 
Um, and it was exciting, um, but I did something which I will admit to. I whitewashed my own book. I pulled out every aspect of color in this book because I was determined to get a traditionally published contract. And although I was excited about the book, I think it's a great book, it wasn't where my heart is. And so as my books start getting browner again, um, it was very difficult to continue to get contracts. So my friend, the one who pulled me out of the gut of water before, she was like, okay, if you believe that this is what you're going to do, what are you gonna do about it? And so I started self-publishing and went on a self-publishing path. And the very, one of the very first books that I, I published um, without any advertisement, people saw the cover and it was like a thousand uh, books in one week. And I was like, okay, so I guess there's a market for this and just keep going. So I would tell anybody out there, if you believe this is what you're called to do, you work as hard as you can to become as good as you can and you keep pushing, you keep publishing or, or submitting, you get into critique groups, you do whatever you need to do in order to bring your work to the marketplace. Can I just mm -hmm. jump in? Yeah, and say, please. This is Eloisa. Um, my first book, I sent it out to those five agents, Vanessa. One of them just wrote on it in ink, this will never sell and sent it back to me. And I was like, you <laughs> asshole, you total asshole. And then when the book came out, they had a party for it at the RWA. And I ran into him walking down the hallway and I was holding the book and he was like, I guess I was wrong, right? <laughs> one of the best moments of my life. But just going from what you're saying, I, I wrote four years ago, I, I wrote my first version of a contemporary love story. So it's not exactly a romance, it's a love story. It has taken four years. It has been ripped apart again and again and again and again and again. It's finally coming out in the summer but I'm, I'm telling you, I had to swallow my pride innumerable, innumerable times. I mean, it literally had like 12 editors. One of them, um, you know, one of them passed away. Uh, my, my agent ripped it apart two years in a row. So writing is like that, right? You gotta, you gotta say, okay, I can't do this right now. I'll do that later. And you just stick with it. I, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got way early on was I'm 50% a romance writer and I'm 50% a businesswoman and a businesswoman comes first. And I will say that having another career has been essential for that because uh, academia is, you know, red in tooth and claw. And, and I have encountered tremendous amounts of sexism and all the rest. And, and you, you sort of learn that, okay, you just got whacked back. Just wait a bit, take a breath, drink a lot of wine, have a bath, go back at it. They, they don't win as long as you don't give up. No, I, uh, it's, it's, and it's fun to be in this moment now because it feels like there's finally more seats to the table and it's just an exciting place to be. And if I had quit, or if Eloise had quit, she wouldn't have her first love story coming out this year. And this moment that we're living in, I would be sitting around real salty right now if I quit, seeing how the, the times are changing. Um, so it's just anybody out there, if you've been told no, if you believe it, do the hard work improve your craft and don't take no for an answer just keep submitting and things happen uh, can i also jump in really quick too vanessa i i told i completely connect with your story as well my the very first agent that i got who looked at my so-called bollywood life said this book will not sell unless you change the hero from being south asian to being white because you want to connect with more people and people won't con won't understand a story between two south asians falling in love which blows my mind because first of all india has a population problem we obviously we know it about love like mm -hmm. you know there's that's not the problem the problem is people's perceptions right so you know i i 100% did exactly what Eloisa said. I had to like take a breath, step back, take a moment. And, you know, they, the, what's, it's true what they say that, you know, a bad agent is worse than, a, than no agent. And so I had to, I had to find someone else who really truly believed in me as much as I believed in me. And you just got to keep going. There's also a balance between 
taking advice and I found if like two or three people say the same thing about my manuscript then they're probably right you know there's probably something wrong but at the same time sometimes I will completely disagree with something my editor says I said no it is my book it's not your book and some things I will actually put my foot on and say no otherwise you write the book or give it to someone else to write this book if you want it's finding that balance of standing up for yourself like you're saying and like at that point that was a hard no right it's like this won't be the book that I want to write that represents me if I change it this much um, I mean, that's a ludicrous thing to say to anyone about the book anyway, but I mean, you could easily have just said, oh, okay, sure. And just, you know, and you would have, you would have got published and you wouldn't have felt true to yourself. And it's, there's the balance between do I write to a market or do I try and, you know, do I try and balance that with what's saleable, but what I want to write. And it's, it's not an easy path. I mean, it's, it's still tricky right now. People, I'm writing Regency. I started out Renaissance Sicily, but it, I'm told nobody wants to to buy that or and I'm like well how do you know if there is no market for it if people aren't buying that and putting it on their shelves this might be the best market ever but and people I self pub that and people still buy it so of course there's a market out there just from numbers like everyone's bored of the eight years or nine years of the Regency that's ridiculous there's all of history out there that we that people are having romances in and there's the whole world <laughs> that people are having romances in so why are we reading about it it, it is a still a lack in the in the general publishing industry not just in the states but worldwide about what people are providing to people to read we're reading because it's on our shelves and it's there to be bought but if there was more choice then of course people are going to read it write your books people out there don't make us do it all we're tired we're writing as fast as we can <laughs> <laughs> i think vanessa your um article in the washington post really spoke to this um that um we loved reading the books back in the day, you know, whatever color or background or whatever we, we had, but now we realize what we were missing. We knew it then, but even more so now, we're definitely seeing it. Um, I love that article, I have to say, and if you haven't read it, people that are here, um, go out and read it, it's amazing. <laughs> I can leave a link in the, um, in the chat, but um, we just have a couple more minutes and I know we had some more questions from the um, attendees, but um, we are about out of time. So I just wanted to ask um, if you guys could um, really quickly tell us about what's coming up for you for your next book or a series or um, brainstorm, whatever, we're good with that. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with Nisha. Um, my next book is Rada and Jay's Recipe for Romance. It's the follow-up to my so-called Bollywood life. It's a YA contemporary. It's not a, it's not a, a rom-com though. <laughs> I know that like with the illustrated cover, sometimes people all automatically assume it's a rom-com. It's not a rom-com. Um, and uh, it's about a uh, Bollywood dance team. So I'm very excited about that. And then my first adult rom-com, it is actually a rom-com, comes out November 2nd. Um, it's called Dating Dr. Dill. And Eloisa, you and I talked about it like two years ago. I finally did it. It's a uh, Taming of the Shrew inspired rom-com. Oh, sorry, were you done? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm done. <laughs> okay. Great. So um, I know that, uh, I'm not sure that's the featured book from Bank Square Books, but you can buy Nisha's books at Bank Square Books. Um, Hey, what's up for you next? Uh, I just had a release about a week ago, which was the last in my uh, Bow Street Bachelor series, which was called uh, Princess on the Road, uh, which was fun. And again, I can't just do Regency. So that's a Russian princess who's faked her own death and ends up in Regency London with a Bow Street runner. So yeah, not that many ballrooms, but it, it was fun to write. And it's got loads of Russian superstitions in it. And it was really fun. And next up, which is the edits I was talking about rocking in a corner, is new series about um, two warring families that have hated each other forever. And uh, they live on the England-Wales border in the Regency. And so it's it's a bit like the Montagues and the Capulets, only they make them look like amateurs. These guys have hate, you know, they are taking it to a new level. And of course, that's going to be enemies to lovers romance. So the first book in that series, which is going to be called, Re oh gosh, we're just deciding on a title. I think it's a reckless match is going to be out in September. So I've got nothing for the next six months, but finish up my Bow Street Bachelor series because that is really fun. There's three of those to, to read. So yeah. <laughs> It is really fun. Vanessa? Okay. So um, funny thing is I've got a couple books coming out this year. So for those who saw A Duke, The Lady and the Baby, this is the follow-up and Earl, The Girl and a Toddler. 
Mm -hmm. um, Lord Ashbrook, who is the newly elevated um, P. Daniel Thackeray. And so for those who've been following the horribly named heroes, P. Daniel Thackeray uh, has been elevated to an Earl and he is a single father, widow, widower single father. Uh, he's the barrister for the widow's grace and he's trying to get out of it because of their, uh, the entanglements are getting too much. He's got pressure from the new Lord Mayor. Um, and so he's trying to find the, the best way to, to keep his aunt from getting into trouble as well as him from getting into trouble. But there's this wonderful little amnesic who is trying to discover her past and they are drawn to each other and he is trying to protect her from her past. So we'll see what wins. And that's an Earl, the girl and a toddler. Um, in July, comes out my first hardcover, Island Queen. Uh, this is a historical fiction set on the true life story of Dorothy Kerwin Thomas. Dorothy Kerwin Thomas starts off her life enslaved, but she's able to save money uh, and make money and buys her freedom and the freedom of her family. She goes on to become one of the wealthiest women in the West Indies. She has a, a wonderful affair with Prince William Henry, the future King William IV. Um, she builds businesses, hotels. Uh, it's a, a, an incredible story. And she was a woman that I think I write her at every book because of the way that she navigates the different classes um, the different stations, and then all of the different islands, because we're talking about, you will be taken to Maserat and Dominica, um, the colony of Guyana, you go to Grenada, you go to Barbados. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a little something I threw together. <laughs> uh, and then in August, my first mass markets, uh, Entangled is actually repackaging the Bittersweet Bride and the Bachelor Bride of the Advertisements for Love series, and it'll be my first time in mass markets. No, you Amazing. Um, Eloisa, I think you have a wild book coming out. I do. I have the last book in my wild series, which is called Wild Child. And to fit in with what we were talking about earlier, it, um, it's a heroine who cross-dresses. She's always wanted to play Hamlet and she's determined to do it. And she thinks that Hamlet is the biggest role. And so um, she plays it, but she realizes he's super whiny and super boring. So it was a fun book. I had a lot of fun writing it. And I think it's funny. The wild series overall is very light and funny and it just um, inadvertently suited this time. And then in the summer, I have Lizzie and Dante coming out, which is coming out under my real name, Mary Bly. So I have a cover, but I don't have a book yet the way Vanessa does. So I'm jealous of that. Um, it's also set in an island on the island of Elba. And it's about a Shakespeare professor who goes over to Italy and falls in love with a chef. And as it happens, I'm married to an Italian and spent every summer in Elba because that's what you, where you bring your kids. Um, if you're Italian, it's the mountains or the beach. So I really know that island very well. And it was fun to write it. And then finally, I have a Christmas anthology coming out with a bunch of my friends. So Christy Caldwell and um, Erica Ridley and Jana, um, oh God, what is McGregor. Jana? McGregor. McGregor. Yeah, McGregor, sorry. Um, I, I get mixed up with people's real names and their other names. Anyway, Jana McGregor, and it's a fabulous story. And we had a great time writing it. And we all edited each other's books, um, which was daunting, you know, I will say. And we edited each other's stories, but it's really, really fun. And so that will be out sometime this fall. And currently called Mistletoe Christmas, but I think we're going to call it something you know, more evocative. I'm suggesting Under the Duke, but they've nixed me because <laughs> I thought it'd be fun, direct and straightforward. But they're like, no, no, it doesn't have Christmas in it. So Under the Christmas Duke, maybe. <laughs> anyway. It must be fun to pick titles and covers. So James, I left you till the end so you would be forced to stay awake. <laughs> um, so yes, so my debut novel, The Flip Side's recently come out. Um, it's about a man in his 20s called Josh. Um, he starts the year in the worst possible way. He proposes to his girlfriend on the London Eye. Um, she says no, and he's stuck in the capsule for another 28 minutes with her. Um, he loses his job, has to move back home with his parents. So really bad uh, start to the year. He decides he's going to flip a coin for all the choices he makes for that year and hopes that's going to help him um, find himself and find love. And yeah, we follow Josh um, for the year. Um, 
so that's just come out and I'm currently on the first draft of my difficult second novel which hopefully will come out at some point. Oh, definitely hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for being here tonight. Um, I've really learned a lot, and this is a topic that I've been really interested in for a long time, and you've just shown so much clarity to me on um, the topics that I'm, in, I'm interested in. <laughs> and um, I think we all look forward to your books. Uh, remember, you can buy signed books from Bank Square Books, um, from all of these authors, not just the ones we've talked about, but um, their backlists as well. So if you're missing something, definitely get it. Um, again, thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful night and a safe, safe 2021. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. It was a lot of fun talking to you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. I mean, Bye, everybody. Absolutely. Bye. It's been a thrill. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night.